Smugheads, and welcome to Smugmo, the Red Dwarf podcast, where we discuss the British cult sci-fi comedy classic Red Dwarf. I'm Ben Gilman, and I'm joined by someone who's very happy to show you his double polaroids. It's Tom Hill. Oi, oi. And I'm also joined by someone who keeps blowing out the lights because he's trying to blow dry his hair. It's Dan Raj. Actually, it knocked out the entire desk this time. We were having that work on uh, Troy's issue with the black hole. Uh, he's back next week. Uh, I've spoken to NASA again, and um, we're having him back next week. Lovely. So, oh, fine. <laughs> what did it turn out to be then? It's just we've got him. We've got like a big fishing rod, and we've grabbed him. It just takes a long time to bring him back in from outer space, so it's going to take about a week. I'm literally just trying to figure out how large a fishing rod you're going to need from Earth to black hole in space and through. The tensile strength on that thing must be um, quite decent. Yeah, it's made out of big, really hard carbon. Um, So today we're, we're talking about season four, episode two, DNA. Smug mode is now engaged. So this episode, a quick summary. Uh, the Red Dwarf crew investigates an alien spaceship that is drifting deep space. They discover a DNA modifier, which to, um, a, gen- a genetic altering machine that alters all organic life, which uh, turns Crichton into a human, Lister into a chicken, uh, and a curry monster made from Lister's curry. So, what do you guys think of this one? Yeah, I'm a fan of this one. I love it. It's great. It's much better than last week's one. Um, uh, from, the, from the very first point where you see that they're sort of like they've docked up with this UFO thing and it looks like a light bulb. A spaceship. From the outside. On the inside it looks like a GCSE art class has been given the gymnasium and told to do an installation based on the works of H.R. Geiger. Well you you know the reason why it looks so shoddy? Why? Because it was actually the last one they filmed and they were running out of money. And they didn't have enough money to put together a better set. We are talking Doctor Who 80s style in terms yeah. of yeah, <laughs> looking tacky. Yeah, but that's just because they actually they were running really low on funds for the set. Hey, I'm not saying I disliked it. No, it's, it's got a proper grungy it's feel. I like it. Red Dwarf, it's, it's brilliant. Okay. Yeah, so, I'm not knocking it, I'm just saying. It's the reason that it looks the way it does. I did. The big, the first big funny scene is um, obviously the cat running around with um, keeps knocking up the console because he wants to dry his hair while they're trying to trying to locate the spaceship. Mm-hmm. Do you guys think of this one? Well, they're all busy working and suddenly the whole thing gets turned off because he's doing his hair. <laughs> yeah. But would a hairdryer really blow out all the no, light? But he, no, I think the whole point was he unplugged the console to plug in the hairdryer. I oh, mean, I've got a problem with this scene because Lister tells him to use one of the side plugs. The wall sockets, yeah. Yep, and he does go and use the wall socket and it still blows out the console. It doesn't blow out the console, it's just so loud it annoys the hell out of them. Okay. It's so noisy they can't hear themselves. So. It also dims the lights, so it does do a sort of That's a brown. That's where I've made my mistake. I do apologise. But for this scene, again, I think I've said this before about Red Dwarf, but whenever they do this kind of stuff, it reminds me an awful lot of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> that same scene, that one where they're above the planet Magrathia and they're trying to do evasive manoeuvres to get away from missiles coming directly at them but the computer is busy trying to figure out how to make this drink that this englishman calls tea why on earth anyone would want to drink such a foul concoction is beyond the computer so it's given up on that calculation it's just focusing on trying to actually make it right (laughs) and just that obliviousness of arthur dent in that scene where he's getting the computer to do that and the sort of self-centered obliviousness of just like completely refusing to see where the fucking problem is from the cat. Mm-hmm. Just they had a lovely parallel for me, and yeah, I liked it for that reason. 
Mm. But once again, Hitchhikers is the industry standard for anything to do with sci-fi and good sci-fi comedy. So. Agreed. <laughs> I've never watched it, so I can't possibly comment. Um, so... You can watch it or read it or listen to it. There are many, many, many... Or go see the stage play. Which what? Or go see the stage play. True. There are many, many versions of Hitchhikers. Okay. All written by Douglas Adams and all fantastic. But... Okay. So, um, the aliens returning Glenn Miller. Who the fuck is Glenn Miller? Like, he's a musician. <laughs> he's like, he's known as like being one of the sort of jazz crooner style musicians who could also do a little bit of the singing. Like, he was pretty much an all-rounder and not just a jack of all trades but almost a master of them at the time mm. he had his own band the glenn miller band and then he disappeared didn't he didn't his plane crash i'm uh, sorry reach the end of my trivia knowledge on glenn miller please try again he, later <laughs> I, I think well no i know he vanished they never found his body but i think he, his plane disappeared if memory serves, I'm just going to have a quick look and see if I can find the details. Okay. But that's why there's the suggestion that he was abducted by aliens. And now they're trying to return him. And as Rimmer said, we don't want this mega. Okay, so we can't have silence here. So, no. Sorry, well, I, just searching. So Rimmer is the same as the cat because he lists all the bad features, but it's pretty much him. Have you noticed that bit? Yeah. That was kind of interesting. But Rimmer doesn't see that in himself. He just talks about... I can't remember what he, who he says it about. You're totally egocentric. You flee at the first sign of trouble. You only look after number one. You're vain, you're selfish, you're narcissistic, and you're self-obsessed. The cat, basically. He's moaning about he the cat. About his qualities. <laughs> He's also just mentioned it himself. But, like, I'm surprised someone didn't point that out. I do like the the scene where Rimmer, uh, Rimmer and Crichton are looking around the ship and um, Rimmer decides to be in the middle. So they end up going around each other in a formation. So Crichton could be the front and the back to protect Rimmer. That's quite funny, going down a corridor. <laughs> yeah, in my experience, it's the sucker at the back. <laughs> Did I you don't get... the front and the back at the same time? <laughs> I do love like the audio on the radio that we get while we're with uh, <laughs> and Cat, but I don't get the line, now, he under... now the guy knows what shirt tails, now Mr. Rimmer knows what shirt tails are for. What? I don't get that joke. Just to hide when you've shat yourself. <laughs> okay. Um, I do love the fact he goes, would you like me to cancel you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is possibly one of my favourite lines. It's beaten only by when Crichton realises that he can actually be changed by that machine. And it's a phrase that I use quite regularly. Dan would have heard me use probably a thousand times. Engage panic circuits. Panic circuits engaged. Ah! Yeah. When something's going wrong. <laughs> yeah. Too many times. Yeah, it's it is something that I quote quite regularly when things don't go according to plan. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> anyway, I do love that. Shall I cancel the order for <laughs> to call your mum? <laughs> hmm. I like the bit with Lister and the cat. It's just after that. Where Lister gets trapped. Do and nothing. Like, Touch oh, stay slinky. I'm on the case here. <laughs> the Do thing back to what we just said about Clayton. <laughs> Brings back to what we just said about Rimmer saying all those things to Cat and what the big difference is. Rimmer, at the end of the day, doesn't actually have any confidence in himself, and when it looks like he does, it's an act he's putting on. The cat, at the end of the day, never has anything but confidence in himself until he's completely fucked up. 
Mm-hmm. In other words, it's a cat. <laughs> yeah. Mm. In other words, Danny John Jules does a good w- role. But there is a rare thing. Um, when the cat says, I go get Crichton, it's the first time he says Crichton. He never says their names normally. The cat never mentions them by name. So that was kind of an interesting moment. Oh, yeah. The cat said, I'll go get Crichton. It's like, oh, wow. Like, okay. okay. Nice. Um, the cat keeps making it worse, though. <laughs> Remember, is so happy to see Lister the chicken for some reason. It's quite funny. Um, I do think that cat finding human crater, um, human crater, is uglier is quite funny. Yeah, but cat finds everybody ugly because he believes yeah, himself to be the physical perfection. Yeah, but he thinks that human uh, crater is uglier is quite funny. Yeah, I like the. Uh... What was the bit where they get Lister back from his ordeal? And Cat's like, what was it like being a hamster? And he's like, it was better than being a chicken. Have you seen the size of an egg? Seen the size of a chicken's bum? I was trying to say a chicken talk. For God's sake, get me an epidural. (laughs) Yeah. Also, um, we have to come to Crichton and the Lister scene. You know, when uh, Crichton becomes a human being. Uh, we're just going to go through this bit by bit. This might take... This <laughs> is my favourite scene of the whole show so far. It's just full of great ones. So we start with... Hello, human. Obviously, Crichton's not used to being human, so um, Lister has to keep... I do love how he's going... Eyes don't have a zoom mode, and he's like, human eyes don't do that. Um, like, move things closer. How do you make, how do you zoom in? You move it closer to your face. I mean, that's, that had me laughing my ass off. Um, human nipples don't work. Um, no matter how hard I twiddle them, I just can't pick up Jazz FM. Yeah. Human nipples don't work like that, Crichton. Um, and then, like he tried to put a recharging socket into his yeah. groin area. In his bum. Is his bum that he's assumes is the gro- is the groinal attachment. Is the okay. is the charging idea. socket. <laughs> yeah. Still quite an it's an anal joke, so boom boom. Um <laughs> bum bum. Ba-dum. I know it's when there's this lovely moment where Crichton wants to talk about his penis. And Lister's smirk is so schoolboy, like <laughs> Willie's is the smirk. It's such a boyish little smirk. Um, um I've actually apparently in recording the scene with the double polaroids, um, that's an actual penis. That Craig Charles did not know that that was an actual um penis. So his reaction is very real. So he wasn't told that he was going to be given a picture of an erect member. No. No. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and then it we does find get a brilliant that, reaction from him, doesn't it? It does. And then obviously the line of, is this normal? Is it normal? Is, is it normal? To, it's not normal to take a picture of your shirt to your mates. No. And I think I still think my... Prefer- <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. I still think I prefer the line... Um, well, is it? It's the uh, no vacuum cleaner should give a human being a double polaroid. Yeah, because you know he was having a look at electrical magazine. I was just flicking through an electrical magazine. I, I love the Crichton bit. Uh, it's hideous. It's the best thing they could come up with. Are you seriously oh, telling me there were choices? And someone said, "Ah, there, that's it. That's the shape we're looking for. The last chicken in the shop." Look, Shakespeare, uh, happens. Einstein. Pete. Hey, Tomo, yeah. saying memories are made of these. One of these stashed in his slats. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just think... Co- go on. Uh, no, no, please go ahead. I was going to say, I quite like the scene where uh, Crichton goes to see the spare heads. Ah. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. Right. I have... Actually, we were talking about this last week. No. 
No, no, we were talking about the double panel. No, no, we didn't didn't mention this, but it was about, like, Crichton and how good Hardy he was, but then how shit he was to Lister whenever... Yes, that's true. Lister was a robot. And also how basically shit he is to these heads now in this scene, now that he's like, oh, but I'm a fucking human. But he is immediately guilty for what he did in that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He realizes like immediately that he's acted like a complete Polaroid head. A point. So, um, <laughs> it's just it's the Sparehead Three, the one that's gone bonkers and has a brummy accent. It's just. <laughs> I would love. <laughs> to see, I would love to see an episode where they stick that brummy one on his head. <laughs> Go on, sling your hook. <laughs> I would love it if Crichton could change heads every episode. Oh. They're completely different personality. <laughs> They're missing a trick there. Oh. Maybe, but I think I think it worked well just as a one-off joke. Just the idea that I... one of his heads has gone completely mm-hmm. loopy. Just for another episode, I would just love to see the Brummy one, Spearhead number three, interact with the crew. That That's all I want now. That's <laughs> why I'm never special. <laughs> Along with the women, the female... Red Dwarf crew. That's what I would like in a future episode to revisit that. That's a great idea. <laughs> and spare hand one? Yeah, middle fingers. Yeah. <laughs> Is it possible to clone people from Dandruff? Theoretically, yeah. <laughs> I did, did, you know that scene, you know, when they're doing that? You know that the um, when they were rehearsed, that wasn't the joke about it. The cat's sneezing all over the, um, all over the, what is it? What's the word? The scope. The scope wasn't in there. And Johnny John Jules actually sneezed by accident during that scene in rehearsals. And they went, oh, that's brilliant. It it was just added in, but it was an accident completely. Johnny John Jules just happened to get the sniffles at that moment in a rehearsal. Yeah. Lovely. But yeah, um, like that, like I said, this is this was supposed to be the last episode of this series, and it was moved around because of the Gulf War. Weirdly enough, uh, why? Because the Gulf War started just as this series kicked off, and they felt that the um, the Wax Droids War episode melt is it meltdown, mm. and um, the Ace Rimmer episode Dimension Jump where he was kind of like a war hero would be somehow contentious at that point. So they moved them to the end of the series mm. and moved everything else up. Basically. Um, talking about hitch, um, hitch guy, um, hitchhikers, this episode has several subtle references to it. DNA are the initials of Douglas Noel Adams. Mm-hmm. Is episode two of season four, which could be written as episode four point two. Leave out the dot. <laughs> two. The skeleton like, with additional heads. Anything? The skeleton with additional heads could be a reference to Zab Hard Beetle Brox. They found Beetle Brox. Yeah. <laughs> Never thought of that, but yeah. Okay, um, so what I want to, I've noticed in the background of the bike scenes, this year they've gone for like a, on the video screen an aquarium type feel All on right. the video screen, which is quite a nice touch. I don't know why it's been in the last two episodes. It's quite relaxing. Um, I do love Lister's secret shame was he went to a wine bar. That made me laugh. Yeah, that is <laughs> that is one of my favourite things. <coughs> mm. The like, absolute shame of it all. <laughs> yeah, because it's like it could have been a different life if he had gone, if he had kept going. Means it was a class traitor. What's <laughs> your <laughs> After pan kitchens, sleeping on futons, eat that didn't work. <laughs> Could have started having relationships with people instead of going up. 
got married, got on the property ladder. God almighty, you know, it's where I could have ended. Next thing you know, I'm playing squash every Tuesday night with a bloke called Gerald. A lucky estate. A lucky estate. <laughs> so, let's talk about the Vindaloo Beast. Oh, God, yeah. So, list it is Robocop. Basically, a mini Robocop. Basically, because this is 1991 when this was made. So, you know. Um... I do love how tiny he is. The reveal of how tiny he is is quite funny. Why not for me? Yeah, they give you a clue with the fact that he's got that high-pitched, squeaky voice to start it. Before you, you just see him, and he looks normal size because of the angle. But when he speaks, you know that he, he sounds like a squeak. Yeah. So that gives you an indication of what might be coming next. I, I'm just going to be honest with you. I did find Cat really funny in this episode. I think it's the funniest he's been. It's just that the fact that he's like playing around with the buttons. It's just great to play with all three of the other main cast this episode. You know, it's just because Cat's normally in the background a lot. This really brought him forward to the front of the episode quite a lot, and I think it's better for it. It's a nice, it's a nice change to have him. This is the first time he's really been at the front of an episode since Waiting for God. That's which it. didn't work. Or is this one does? And the cat is just very good with pressing buttons and remembering the sequence. I wouldn't have been able to do that, so yeah. He didn't remember the sequence. <laughs> no, but he managed to make it work and get things to do things, so that's still quite impressive. Um we find out <laughs> that's been a year since Polymorph in terms of community. Like it's been a year in the yep. show's history, so it's been a, one year since. With a great line, how can it happen to the same guy twice, smegging twice, or something? How can this? How can the same smeg happen to the same guy twice? Yeah. There we go. And obviously, the only. I don't know if this is American. We got a lot of American listeners, so let me just explain something to you. I don't know if this is a English thing. I think it is. Obviously, the only thing that can stop a la- a vindaloo is lager. That's all British men know. Yes. Hmm. More specifically, if you're going to get really technical, Cobra is the one that's going to really save you if you go for a vindaloo. <laughs> Oh, good to know. Um, or but they basically do a draw. Up the size of Lake Michigan. <laughs> this stuff is really good. <laughs> I love the bit where it's ah lovely. I see he's, um eating it afterwards after it's exploded. Yeah. <laughs> That's a dirty <laughs> bastard. Um, <laughs> this guy is pure class. <laughs> But I do think that there's a tribute to Jaws, though, because they stick the lager can in his mouth. Well, originally when, they, originally when they um, filmed it, he yeah. missed the shot missed two or three times before Just it hit the lager can, which is what all happens in Jaws. So, yeah, yeah. It, is, it is a nod to Jaws. Uh, and the original filming was actually even closer. Yeah. More, more explicitly a nod to Jaws. My wife pointed that one out. She said, that's very Jaws. I was like, ah, oh, it's most probably a reference to Jaws. Oh, well, yeah. I, th- I think you'll find the, the guys who wrote Red Dwarf knew pretty much everything they were referencing. I mean, I, and, and Lister turning into a mini Robocop as well. That, that's it's good. Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> Especially it's very old time, but it's funny as hell. Especially with his squeaky scouser voice. <laughs> Not that I'm laughing at Liverpillians. Right. So so what do we generally think of this episode altogether? It's a damn good episode. Mm. Not, okay. Like it's not the worst episode you could actually like if you were just coming across randomly for your first time a Red Dwarf episode, it's not the worst one to happen at random. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm kind of torn 
with this series. There are whereas in previous series I've kind of known what my list of best to worst was. This series is a lot harder to hit. I can tell you what my favourite one is because I think it's probably everybody's and it's the emergence of Ace Rimmer, which is just flipping hilarious in every respect. I can't but you've wait. got but you've got DNA, Justice, White Hole and Meltdown are all very much on a level for me. I like all of them for different reasons. And I can't actually kind of order them of worst to best, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. They all they interchange depending on my mood because they've all got lines in them that make me wet myself with laughter. Mm. Like, I mean, obviously we're going to get to this in a couple of weeks, but playing pool <laughs> with planets is one of my favourite scenes ever. Yeah. Just stuff like that, but it's not my favorite episode. Yeah, but no, DNA is an unbelievably solid episode. Yeah. It's got lots of good jokes in it, lots of things that make you laugh at, not just chuckle, but actually properly guffaw with laughter. Like the double Polaroid thing is just, it's such a simple joke, but Lister's reaction to it is one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see. The timing on it as well. Yeah. The fact that he has the first Polaroid and he's like trying to angle to see where and he's got the second one and initially the first one doesn't match up and he still can't tell and then, then the sudden the realisation <laughs> as it twists into a certain configuration is it <laughs> <laughs> exactly. According to Craig Charles he was trying because they didn't he was just reacting to it and he was actually yeah. trying to figure it out in real time yeah, which is brilliant. Love if that. that's if that's true, I absolutely love that. Oh no, it's true. It's been it's on record. That's why I love it. it. Doesn't mean it's true. It could be revisionist after the fact, but we take it as read because Craig Charles has said it. Yeah, and Craig so, Charles but, might just be an aberration. It just uh, um, just to make it funnier. Yeah, it could be, but we'll take. We've got no reason to disbelieve the man, so let's take it as true that that was that's why the timing on it is so good. Is because Craig Charles was actually doing it in real time, which is awesome. But one, I, I was thinking about this the other day, and I thought slightly about it for season three, but season four is probably truer. I think that particularly in the case of Craig Charles and Danny John Jules, they'd become better actors by this point. You know what I mean? They both... Danny John Jules was a performer, he was a dancer, he was those kind of things, but not really a character actor. When he got the role in Red Dwarf, Chris Barry was a voiceover guy and an impressionist. Wow. The only sort of out and out actor was um, Robert Llewellyn. Yeah. And I think by the time you get to season four, all of them have actually become far better actors. So their timing is better, their hit rate is better. Yeah. Because they actually they've they've become better performers. So the writing is fantastic, but then you've also got an improved level of skill of the performers come together to make... I mean, I've, I've argued this before. Seasons four, five, and six, for me, are the best three seasons that Red Dwarf ever did. Mm. And so this is the beginning of, like, a real sort of golden period for this show. So we won't be able to bitch about it at all, and I'm looking forward to that. There, you, you'll always be able to find some fault. But like, not a lot. We're not, not a like, lot, I no. They're, remember... they're brilliant episodes. That's the good thing about this show, though. We never have to really find inspiration for, like, a good... Well, how, how often do we actually really criticise this show? We've no, criticised one or two episodes for not being great, and even then we found things that we love about those episodes as well. Yeah, that's it. That's why I love this show. Oh yeah, there, there isn't a single thing... The only thing that I ever truly disliked, and we will get to it, is the recasting of Kachansky when they got to season seven. That would be a long season, but even yeah. then, there's a lot of good stuff right. about it. But actually, you go back and watch it again now. In I remembered it being bad or not not as good. I've gone back yeah. and watched it without kind of like the the attitude of it being the first time I'd watched it. And actually, it's bloody funny. Yeah, like, they I've do. A lot of good season eight recently. It's better than I remembered. Yes, absolutely. Season seven and then are both amazing... far more worthy than I thought they were. Try to be classified as a woman in a tampon. We'll get to that in a couple of months. <laughs> like maybe next year. Wow, that, that probably like... is next year now. Yeah, 
but yeah, we're, we're, sorry, we're getting well ahead of ourselves. It's just yeah. all of us are passionate about this show. I'm merely voicing a very particular opinion on it. By the end of this season, we would have been a quarter of the way through. Well, <gasps> third of the way through. Yeah, well, you know they've just announced they're doing another series. Yeah, well, we'll bring it. Uh, <laughs> if it's not out by the time we get there, we'll just come and bring it back when the season starts. For a bit. And at that point, I think with, with that, we need to, you know, make the surrender it. flag out of the flock wallpaper and, and just... <laughs> definitely. Just okay, call so... it there for, for this one. <laughs> yeah. I right, think that's so a perfectly done. reasonable call, Mr. Rudge. So we're done. And um, so it's another, it's another banger. <laughs> um, that reminds me why I love this, episode, this series so much. Yep. Um, totally. And it's always, yeah. And I still think it will be hard to top the double Polaroid scene for me in terms of single... Epis- single scene, best scene for me. It's always a double Polaroid. <laughs> but I think the tampon scene with um, Crichton will be funnier. But I don't know. Anyway, it's goodbye for me. Bye for me. I can't keep up. I'm knackered. <laughs> <sighs> Smeg off you smegheads. <laughs>